Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. And uh, tonight we're going to be continuing with our new series, Following Christ. It's good to be together again. Tonight we're going to pray. We're going to ask God to bless each and every one of us, to open our minds and our hearts, our understanding to the Word of God. It's a good thing to know that we serve a mighty God who is able and capable of keeping us through so much. I hope you had a great week so far. I know that uh, it has been hot, but uh, the heat hopefully has broken and uh, you guys can go back outside again. Well, we all can go back outside again and um, not burn up and not get heat stroke. God is good, isn't he? He knows what we can bear and how much we can bear. So tonight, if you do have a prayer request, uh, we're going to pray together. Keep that prayer in your heart and ask God to anoint whatever you need changed in your life so that you can change. Let that be a part of the prayer as well. We want the word of God to change us tonight. And every time we hear it or read the word of God, amen. There are people who are sick. I want you to pray over that sickness, that disease right now. There are people that are sick in your family or in your sphere of influence. Just whisper their name as we're beginning to pray. Whatever the need is, God can do it. All you need is a little faith. Let's go before the Lord in prayer right now. Mighty God, we come before you right now. We are so grateful and honored and thanking you, God, for all that you have done. Lord, we thank you for the stars and the moonlight and the setting sun. 
We're so grateful for life and breath. Lord Jesus, we could complain tonight. We could complain about all that we don't have. We could complain about, Lord God, the things we desire and the things we want. But God, tonight, we want to take the time to thank you for all that you have done. We pray for those that are sick and afflicted. God, there are people that are struggling tonight, people with headaches and dealing with all kinds of sicknesses, whether it be cancers or heart disease, God, COVID. There's so many sicknesses and diseases, God. Now we have monkeypox. We're praying, God, that you would heal because you're, you are still the bomb in Gilead, God. You are still our physician. We pray tonight, God, for those who need deliverance, whatever it may be that they need deliverance from. It might even be themselves, but whatever it is, God, you are able. You are still able. We give you praise and glory, God. Whatever people are praying for in their hearts, help them, God, and help them to turn it over to you, Jesus, because I know you've got the answer. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen. Do you believe it? Do you believe that God can help you? Do you believe that there is strength? Amen, that you never had before that God will give you in your spirit right now so that you can bear up under whatever it is that you're going through. Just trust him and he will deliver you. Amen. Pray for somebody right now as you watch this. following Christ. Are you ready to follow him tonight? Have you been giving thought to these Bible lessons? You know, the word of God is true and it's clear in so many respects regarding what God is asking of us and what we are required to do. Notice I used the word required because sometimes, especially in Christianity today, many preachers and teachers teach as though we do have a choice as to how we serve God. We can't always come to God the way we want to. We have to come to him the way he expects us to. I was thinking the other day that even in our present times, that it is required if you were going to go into the presence, the presence of a monarch, whether it be the queen of England or any of the other monarchs, quite, they're not, not as many today as they had years ago, but you have to go into their presence the way that they require you to. You can't just go in the way you want to. And yet still, we have so many teaching that it is okay to just be whatever you need to, to be for you. And, and, and you can just live the way you want to and go into God's presence. Well, listen, when you follow Jesus, there are very specific things that Jesus required. There was one point when Jesus said, if you really and truly love me, he said that you would keep my commandments. The question is, what commandments are people keeping? Are they really reading the book? Are we trying to interpret our way out of doing what the Lord is asking us to do? Or are we willing to pay the price? Are we willing to sacrifice? To say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Well, tonight we want to look at this Bible lesson again. Following Christ. Following Christ. And I want you to turn with me to James chapter 4. And we're going to look at verses 6 through 8. And it says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humility cures worldliness. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw, draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify 
your hearts, you double-minded. Now, James wasn't writing to sinners out in the world. He was writing to the church. And yet still, even though he was writing to the church, so many probably thought that they could do whatever they wanted to do. For instance, when we look at this particular scripture, we look at uh, verse um, 6, and it says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humility cures worldliness. Therefore, submit, your, submit therefore to God. But when this verse is usually quoted, it's quoted like this. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The whole first portion of that is totally ignored and afterwards totally ignored. But read it again. Can we read it one more time? But he gives, this is God now, gives more grace. Therefore he, God says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. We have to learn how to be humble before God in submission. That means we have to let, listen, we're not perfect, but we cannot accept our weaknesses. And we should certainly, when we know what they are, place them at the feet of Jesus and ask God to forgive us and to say, God, I don't want to be this person anymore. I want to be like you. And so we need to be humble as we, be, we come before God. And the Bible says humility is what cures worldliness. When we're humble before God, then we don't ever have to worry about a mind that is being drawn to the world because our humble nature and characteristics before God will keep us in a place where we can hear from God and we can judge ourselves before God judges us. Verse seven says, there is a submission that needs to be made to God. We need to submit to God, resist the devil, and then he will flee from us. I want to read something else taken from Mark chapter 8. Because Jesus came and submitted himself, humbled himself, submitted himself to the flesh, a body. Amen. God was manifested in the flesh. The Bible says justified in the spirit in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3. And it's important that we understand that Jesus Christ said, no one will take my life. I'm going to lay my life down. So he gave himself for you and I. The Bible tells us in verse 31 of Mark 8, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. Notice here again, Jesus never once mentioned the Romans. He never once mentioned a soldier killing him. He mentions these who were religious. And it's important for you and I to keep that in mind because religion won't save you, but your walk with God and your obedience and submission to him and obedience to his word, that is, will save you. Because when we're obedient to his word, then we are, we are right with God. When we disobey his word, listen, God did not give Moses a pass. When Moses didn't sanctify the Lord before the people, when Aaron, the, 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 the high priest, didn't sanctify the Lord before the people, God says, you shall not see the promised land. And so while the Lord loved Moses, he said, you know what? No, no, no. You did not live the way you ought to. You did not obey me before the people. And so you know what? Even in Aaron's case, he helped them to create an idol so that they would worship that idol instead of God. And then he blamed the people for it. And so it's important for you to understand that there are more challenges in the church than we even face outside of the church. Let's continue to read. He spoke this, verse 32, this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. The church is in that condition today. Very mindful of the things of men, but not the things of God. They worry about the bling that's hanging around their necks and, and the rings on their fingers and the cars that they drive. Those are the things that's important. But a true submissive walk to God, very difficult for even the people of the church to fulfill and to carry through because as we go back to James chapter 4 that we just read that people are not humble before God. Amen. The Bible says in verse 34 when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also he said to them 
whoever desires to come after me. Here it is again. Let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Verse 35 tells us, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange? What will he barter for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the, the holy angels. Tonight, I want to talk to you with uh, from the subtitle of Following Christ, I've Decided. Have you decided to follow him tonight? I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And that's important for us to keep in mind when we're going through this lesson tonight. Are you willing to say, Lord, whatever it takes, I'm going to choose you each and every time. Last week, we talked about the call. and You have to go and look at that lesson to understand where I'm coming from this week because that call is important. It's serious. But when we come before the Lord, amen, it's important to keep in mind that there has to be a submission, a denial of self, a submission to God, a denial of self. Lord, it is your will, not my will. Thy will be done, not my will be done. And so Jesus came to die, according to scripture here, for our sins. And he came to show us that we should take our eternal condition, amen, after death, because after death, the Bible says there will be the judgment, that we should take that very, very seriously. But for many today, just like in those days, they sought Jesus for what they could get, the blessings, the bread, the fish, the healing. Yeah, many of them showed up for that. But when Jesus was being beaten and tortured, they weren't there. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, they weren't there. Only a handful. I can count them on one hand that were there and that were willing to risk being associated with Jesus. Amen. Because they loved him and they wanted to be there. Peter wasn't there. He had denied Jesus three times. Judas wasn't there, the one that had sold him for 30 pieces of, pe uh, pieces of silver because he had committed suicide. And the rest of the disciples, the 12, they had scattered everywhere. So yeah, you know what? It's so um, interesting how we want so much from the Lord, but we're so willing to give little. Amen. Not willing to give a lot. We're willing to give a little as though that's all we can afford when God has given us so much. Remember the scripture tells us, to whom much is given, much is required. Salvation is much. Amen. Some of us have been healed. That's a lot. Some of us have been delivered from things that plagued us for so many, many decades of our lives. That's a lot. And if God has done nothing for you but give you salvation, that is a lot. And so it's important to see what scripture is talking about here. We need to make a decision to follow so that you understand what this is all about. To be a follower of Christ is to be a disciple. And what is a disciple? Or discipleship itself is really what it boils down to. It is the process of becoming a committed follower of Christ. That word is almost a curse word. Amen. Commitment. <laughs> People can't commit to anything today. They can't commit to relationships. They can't commit to jobs. They can't even commit to friendships. It's almost as if we are living in such, which actually not as, as if we are living in a dysfunctional world, very dysfunctional. And social media has shown us that what it is here in the United States is the same all across our world. Selfishness runs rampant. People are always looking out for themselves. And sometimes even in families where people should love one another and, uh, you know, reach out to help one another. It's not that way. And so, yeah, you know, we need to make a decision that I'm going to follow him. That's discipleship, the process of being committed to him. Amen. And it just to be a dis, being a disciple, it, it, you know, it, 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 and, and to take our, our, our calling seriously is something we should always put at the top of the list. It is to be totally committed. Being a disciple, being a disciple is to help others become disciples of Christ. 
Amen. And being a disciple is to live a life of obedience and sacrifice. Over and over again in scripture, Jesus called people to follow him. He called prostitutes, murderers, wicked people. He even called so-called good people to follow him. Amen. So-called good people. Even though one um, person called Jesus good master, and the Lord says, don't call any man good, even though he was good. But he set the precedence. He said, no, 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 no. Don't call anybody good. So following Christ should be the single most important thing that's at the top of our list each and every day of our lives. You know, God, the creator, chose to die for wicked, sinful men. And one songwriter says, for one such as I, the king came to die. For one such as I, death he defied. And I may never know why he loved me so, that to an old rugged cross he'd go, who am I? So will the inhabitants of this world ever be concerned for their own spiritual condition? Will the inhabitants of our city, our fair city right here in New York, ever be concerned about their eternal soul? How many times have we gone out on the streets and preached this gospel, thank God for social media, We've been out here and, and just beating the path and trying to get people to hear the word of God. But, you know, it's like those fishermen that Jesus spoke to that night. And they said, Master, we've toiled all night and we've caught nothing because Jesus asked them, have you caught any fish? And then Jesus said, just throw the net on the other side. So many times we find ourselves shifting the net and getting some souls. And so you know, the pickings seem so slim because people want church without commitment, church without sacrifice. They want to walk with God where they don't have to make any commitment. The first step in making your decision is faith, faith, faith. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse six, but without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. That means we are faithfully and committedly making an effort every day, every single hour, minute of our lives to seek him, to seek his face. Have you made your decision today to follow him? All it takes is faith, according to this scripture. And I mean anything. Are we willing to submit ourselves to him? You know, when we say, I've decided to follow Jesus, and we even sing the song, no turning back, no turning back, the cross before me, yes, I'm still going to follow. In other words, whatever comes my way, I'm still going to follow until that first trial comes or until that situation in life comes that we never expected that hurts so much. And then we find ourselves backing away from the, the master, the only one that can help us. No wonder we plunge sometimes into that dark pit of depression and anxiousness and fear because we vacillate. You know, we're with God 100% in this moment and then we're not with him in the next moment. We're with him 50% here, then we're not with him there. It's because we're not committed. We think that the word commitment means that, you know, I just do what I can. No, commitment goes beyond what you can. It, it takes you to a place where you say, I will sacrifice beyond my circumstances to be what I need to be for him. I will sacrifice beyond my circumstances. That's commitment. Commitment isn't, you know, I feel like serving God really wholeheartedly today. I feel like going into the word of God really wholeheartedly today. Uh, tomorrow, not so much. That isn't commitment. We really and truly need to be committed to this God that we serve. You see, it says, but without faith, it is impossible, impossible to, to please God. I want to share with you a story that I read about faith. And it was, I read this story many years ago, but I want to share this story with you again because it's important. Back in, I think it was about 1940, no, 1950s, I believe it was, to, to the 70s, there was a doctor uh, who went to the Congo in Africa to serve and she was a trained physician and uh, she was there to help and to train others how to care for themselves. It was during a time, not like we have today, 
where transportation was so easy. Most people traveled by boats because they couldn't afford, uh, especially in the 40s and the 50s, to even uh, buy a plane ticket. And especially when you're out there trying to do good and you're not rich, you're just doing it from a good heart. And she was there and the story goes like this, and I'm going to read some of it for you because I don't want to miss the important parts. But there was a time when she would help these mothers who had, uh, who were in labor and, and some of them had their babies. Some of these mothers would die. And sometimes both mother and baby would die. They didn't have the facilities as she had in 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 back home where she lived. And, and, and of, of course, the hospital uh, hospitals of the, that day, for instance, in the United States, in England, they were very, very um, uh, up to date in terms of science and medicine and technology that would be able to perhaps save the life of a mother and a baby. But when you're in the Congo in 1950s and 1960s, where everything was just difficult to get, no stores down the road, this doctor did what she could. Well, one night she was working late and a mother came in and she was getting ready to give birth to a child. And so she's working feverishly and she finally saves the baby, but the mother passed away. In the rush of trying to do everything, because in the Congo, especially back then, I don't know what it's like now with global warming, but um, at nights it would get very cold, very cold. You know how the desert is during the daytime, it's very hot, but at nights, super cold, you need a coat. And that's how it was. And so there was a specific box that they would rush to and in it would be everything that they needed to handle a situation just like this. And her assistants were well-trained. They opened up the box. They started pulling out what they needed. They took out a blanket because they needed to wrap that baby up. And one assistant took out a water bottle and the doctor gave the directions, go get that bottle filled up. So they stoked the fire and they began to warm some water up. And as she begins, this, this assistant, to fill the water bottle, it burst. She runs back to the doctor and she's, she's telling this doctor, oh my goodness, I can't believe now. She is literally falling apart because there aren't any CVSs, Walgreens down the road for her to run to a supermarket and buy a water bottle. I mean, the water bottle was gone. And if this baby could not be kept warm, it could potentially die. So it is important for you and I to understand that there are situations in life that may have been many years ago, decades ago, but some of us face situations in life where we feel as though all hope is lost. I can't serve God like I need to. I know there's a calling on my life, but can I really serve him? I mean, look what I'm going through. And we take that mentality of whining and complaining about where we are except that there is a God who can bring you from where you are to where you need to be. So that faith level needs to be risen up to a place where we can say, you know what? I trust that God can do anything. The doctor's training kicked in. She's doing her best, but she's really not holding out with much hope for this baby. Because if they didn't have that water bottle to keep that child safe, the, the blanket was not enough. That night, she told one person to sleep close by the door so that that person's body would block any of the cold air that would be coming in. That's how cold it got. And that most of it would not hit the baby and someone else would sleep close with the baby next to them. But you want to be able to have the right things because other mothers would be coming in and they too would need help. And can you imagine now if they had another person that would have a child that, that they would need this help? Anyway, each day this doctor would have a prayer meeting with the, the orphans that were in that particular village that she stayed in. Every afternoon she would go around and she would ask these young children to come on out if you can join me and pray with me. As a part of that prayer, what she would do or that time of prayer, she would instruct them on what to pray for. Perhaps asking them in some instances what their needs were, etc. But on this day, she was so filled with just the fear of this child's life that she begins to ask the children to pray with her. She told them the story of this baby being born 
and uh, that if this baby didn't get this water bottle, that the chances of survival were slim. We need to pray. We need to pray. And also that little baby had a, a sister who was older, who was about two or three years old. And this little girl now had no mommy because mommy passed away. And they begin to pray. I want you to listen to this particular prayer from a little child. During the prayer time, one 10-year-old little girl begins to pray. Her name was Ruth. She prayed with the usual blunt conciseness, this doctor says, of the African children. In other words, God can do it because that's what they were told. And so she begins to pray. Please, God, she prayed, send us a water bottle. It'll be no good tomorrow, God, as the baby will be dead. So please send it this afternoon. That doctor had worked all night. Thank God the baby survived. The night was afternoon, almost afternoon. And, and so later on that afternoon, the, the, they needed that water bottle. So this doctor gasped inwardly because could she really say amen to a prayer like that? Would any of us be able to say amen when you're going through something and someone prays the impossible? It may be even me in our church. Sometimes I lay my hands on you and I pray for you and I tell you God can do it. But do you really believe it? Do you really believe that God can heal you right then and there, deliver you before you get home? Do you really believe it? This doctor said that she gasped inwardly. She didn't want to show it. But she wondered, could I really say amen? But that little 10-year-old girl was not done yet because this is what she prayed afterwards. And she says, Lord, while you're at it, can you imagine the audacity of that little girl? She says, while you're at it, I want you to send that little girl a dolly so that she will not be so alone. Now, that just floored the doctor. There is no way that was going to happen, but she got up and she went about her business. As she was busy that day, her story goes that someone ran to her and said, there's something for you. There's a mailman and, and, and he dropped a, a something off and she runs to her house and she sees this parcel that was sitting there in front of her house. Now her heart is beating really fast because she's wondering what potentially could be in that parcel. She picks the parcel up and she decides that since she just prayed with the children, they would open it together. She opens it up and she begins to find different things. She says from the top, she lifted out brightly colored knitted jerseys. Eyes sparkled as the kids knew that those were for them. And then there was the knitted bandages for the leprosy patients that they were taking care of. And the children looked a little bored. <laughs> they were looking for stuff for themselves. Isn't that quite like us today? God, I can't worship you till you bless me. God, I know everybody else is being blessed, but what about me? You know, I mean, how selfish can we get? Well, those children were pretty selfish in that regard. Then came a box of mixed raisins and other things that would make a nice batch of, of buns for the weekends, she said. Then as she put her hand back in there, she felt that there was something else. She begins to feel this thing. It was made of rubber. And when she pulls it out, it is a rubber bottle. A rubber bottle. Now, I can't imagine that little girl probably looked up and wondered, man, my God is really awesome. But this woman, this woman of God, a doctor that said, you know what? God can do anything because she was teaching the children that. Doubted that God could actually do that. And so she, she said... Um, you know, let me go back in there. And, and she begins to rummage down in the box now, wondering, is the dolly there? And she finds a little doll. And of course, the little girl, she didn't care about the fact that this was a miracle because she prayed and she believed. You know, in Matthew, the book of Matthew, I believe it's chapter 18, Jesus once says to his disciples, he said, except you become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of God, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. This little girl prayed. She believed it. She wasn't shocked at all. She grabs the doll and she says to the doctor, can I come with you? Because I want to give this to the little girl. 
Some of the things we pray for sometimes, we doubt God. No wonder we don't get those things. So what's next? If you have faith, God can do anything, right? So what's next? If you have faith and you can trust God. Well, the Bible tells us in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 6 and verse 9, uh, verses 6 through 9, and you can read it with me. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica said this, So you became our followers and the Lord's, for you received our message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the trials and sorrows it brought you. Then you yourselves became an example to all the other Christians in Greece. And now the word of the Lord has spread out from you to others everywhere, far beyond your boundaries, for wherever we go, we find people telling us about your remarkable faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it, for they keep telling us about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from your idols to God, so that now the living and true God only is your master. I mean, I'm reading this and all kinds of things are coming to my mind because you're looking at people that were so mindful of sharing this wonderful thing that had happened to them that they they didn't even care that there was other things going against them. And we are not living in times like they did in Thessalonica. Their very lives were in jeopardy. They could have been jailed and even murdered and, uh, and prosecuted for... Uh, just serving Christ. So just think about that for a second. You know what? These people lived in a time where they were persecuted for following Christ, but they received the gospel. They received the gospel of Jesus Christ with joy, with joy, with joy, knowing fully well that they were about to be persecuted. They still served, received this with joy and served the Lord with joy. But it didn't end there. They served the Lord with such willingness and unrestraint that they themselves began to share Christ with many others. And, it, you know, it's, it's just interesting how the scripture here enlightens us as to how that happened. He says that even though yourselves were, were, were in jeopardy, you became messengers of Christ, the apostle said, so that we didn't have to even preach it because you did. Now that's serving with commitment. Their commitment went beyond their challenges. Look at us. We're living in a time where there's air conditioning. Some of us complain that we don't have air conditioning, but we've got fans. Can you imagine people who live in places where there are no fans at all? They can't even afford a fan, even right here in New York and other places in the United States of America. There are people struggling. People have died even in England. Remember just a few weeks ago when the, the heat got so bad, many homes did not have air conditioning. I mean, places literally just caught fire and people lost their lives because they had no air conditioning. And some of us, we have so much but we complain even the more and we never thank God for where we are. We never thank God. Oh, you know, the other day I was talking about this saying that I had read about a few years back and I was just sharing it about knowing how to, to just to have a little joy, you know, even though you're looking at the pieces of your life, the broken pieces, you can still have joy. And when you have Christ, that joy can be even more exponential because Christ is with you. In spite of all the brokenness that you're dealing with in your life, put him first. And so they were persecuted. They received this joy, amen, uh, and, and the gospel with joy, and they served the Lord with willingness and unrestraint. They never complained. And even if they did, they certainly didn't show, show it in their actions. They told others about their walk with God. Sometimes we forget that we're not just living this life alone. That when God places a calling on our lives, that we have a decision to make. And that decision is very serious for God. He's watching you and I, and he's wondering, you know, well, some of you made a decision to serve me, but then you kind of forgot the sacrificial part of it. So now you're dibbing and dabbing here and there, and you're bringing things into your walk with God that should never be there because it is reminiscent of the world. And so we're not really living him with uh, 
uh, willingness and commitment and unrestraints. In, in other words, Lord, I'm going to take off all the restraints of things that I say, God, that, you know, is just stopping me from serving you. And God, everything to do with this world, God, I'm just going to turn my, my eyes away from it. The song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full on his wonderful face, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. The problem is our eyes are too set on this world, so we can't see Jesus. You know, you can't look at both. You, you've got to look at one or the other. And the nice thing about it is when we see Jesus, we'll be able to see the world, but in a different way, through the lens of compassion, Christ's compassion. And then we can really and truly deal with our family members from that place of power and authority, taking dominion even over things they have no control over because you are the priest or priestess of your home. Amen. And you are of, of your family and you can begin to speak some things and God will respond because of your prayer, your prayer. Amen. Don't forget. Don't ever forget what the Bible says. Second Peter three and verse eight and uh, through 10 tells us, but beloved, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And so the apostle Peter is trying to bring us into remembrance here that there is a life after this one. Whatever we're thinking about, that is so important in this life that it's literally stopping you from being committed to your walk with God. Is it that much more important than you're facing eternity and facing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that will judge us? The Bible says we're, we're going to be judged by, by every word that we've spoken and every deed done in our bodies. So yeah, you know, there is that judgment coming. But what are we doing now? That is not yet. The Lord has given us this period of grace. What are you doing with that period of grace? He has placed such a call upon our lives. Many are called. We reminded ourselves last week through scripture, but few are chosen. And again, you have to understand through that teaching, go back and look at it. Amen. What that means. And today I'm saying to you, you've received the calling and you say, Pastor, how have I received the calling? The fact that you're even listening to this message, the fact that you even attend our church, the fact that some of you, I don't care if you're in another country, but you are hearing this message and those that will be listening to this message later on, because the Lord tells us clearly in the word of God that this gospel will be preached to everyone in every country, every nation, every tongue, every, kin every kindred, and then shall the end come. Can you imagine with the proliferation of the internet and of course, social media, YouTube and all of that? This world is filled with preaching. I don't care if you are living in a place where you don't see tall buildings and, and you're living in a very small place. It doesn't matter. Technology has reached every corner of our world and this gospel has been preached to every corner of this world. So that grace is still here, but the Lord says, I'm coming as a thief in the night. Will you be ready? He has called you and I. Have you obeyed his calling? Have you obeyed his calling? Have you made a decision tonight to serve him? Have you made a decision to serve him? I'm going to pray for you tonight. Mighty God, we come to you right now. We are really graciously, Lord God, seeking your face. We know, God, that there is nothing we can do in and of ourselves. And so, God, as the, the Bible tells us, God, that we should submit ourselves to you, God. We should come to you, God, in submission. We can't even go to the devil, Lord God, and say, devil, you did this to me. God, we have to look at ourselves. We are the ones that need to make the decision to say, Lord, I have decided to follow Jesus and I won't turn back. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice, those who are here tonight, those who will be listening afterwards, God, even over on YouTube. I pray that there be a move of God, conviction that will touch hearts and minds and that people will say, Lord, I've heard your call 
And my answer is yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. And Lord, when your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart, I'll agree. And my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. I hope this Bible study did something for your heart tonight. If nothing else, that it will cause you to think uh, more than you've ever about your decision to serve him with full commitment, wholeheartedly, taking off all restraints and complaints and even excuses and saying to yourself, Lord, I'm going to serve you with all of my heart. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And you will see us again on Sunday. We'll be in the building live, but we'll still be broadcasting. Spread this gospel. Share this over on YouTube. Like, share, and subscribe. And if you can't witness to somebody, send them the video. Send them the link. Amen. I love each and every one of you. Good evening to you. And God be with you till we meet again.